Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. To honor copyright laws, we have removed some audio and video elements from this message. Now here's this week's message. How are you? Good to see you. Well, God uses ordinary people. That's good news because I see a lot of ordinary people here, including myself. I mean, we're normal, ordinary people. Sometimes we look in the Bible and we think, wow, look at those are real heroes of faith. I could never do that. But yet we see over and over God choosing people that are very ordinary, maybe even unexpectedly subordinary. And God uses them in supernatural ways. And we're going to be looking in this series, this four-week series, Unsung Heroes. We're going to be looking at some of those uh, heroes that would be kind of surprising to us. Maybe you haven't even heard of their names before. We're going to be looking in the book of Judges. If you want to open your Bible to the book of Judges, we're going to be looking over Judges a few chapters. So we'll be kind of just getting an overview of that. Chapters 6, 7, 8, a little bit into 9. And we're going to be looking at this guy named Gideon. Uh, you may not know him. You might think, who's Gideon? See the guy who puts all those Bibles in the hotels? <laughs> He's the one who wrote those Bibles. Well, actually, uh, they named that organization after this guy. This guy is a man of, uh, who, who has this encounter with God, grows in his faith, does some amazing stuff. And it's quite surprising. Because God just takes this ordinary guy. Now, this is, this is his story, Gideon, is he's very, very ordinary. And, but what is happening in his country, he's, he's an Israelite. He lives in Israel. This was uh, thousands of years ago. And uh, the uh, Midianites, an enemy nation, had come into Israel and was really trying to destroy the Israelites. They were, they, it was really, it was, they were way over and outnumbered by this, by this enemy nation. They had 135,000. They had come in very aggressively, and they were killing any Israelites they saw. And they were really, the Israelites were running. They were hiding. They were hiding in caves. They were just trying to survive. And the Midianites were using a very aggressive policy, which now today we call it the scorched earth policy. They didn't use that term back in those days, but that's what they did. They went in, they ate whatever they wanted of their crops and their cattle, their livestock, and if they didn't, it couldn't use it, they would just destroy it just so that the Israelites couldn't have it. So they just would destroy their crops, destroy their livestock, literally just trying to starve them to death. And there's this guy named Gideon. He's, just, and he's one of these Israelites. He's hiding, and in this case, when we drop into this story, he is hiding in a wine press. Now, a wine press is, of, is, is, is found like in valleys. They would make these down in valleys, and it says that he is threshing wheat, which is kind of like odd. If you know anything about th those days of threshing wheat, they would, they would take all their wheat, and the way that they would separate the wheat from the chaff is they would take it to the top of a hill, and usually when an afternoon wind would come, they would take their pitchforks or whatever, they would throw it in the air, and it would separate the wind because the chaff is much, so, is much lighter. Would, the wind would take that, blow that off, the wheat would come down, and that's how they would gather their wheat. Well, he is not on the top of a hill. He is in the bottom of it. He's in a valley inside a wine press. He's hiding because he's afraid for good reason. He's fighting for, he's just trying to survive. So he's hiding in this wine press. He's afraid. 
He does not feel successful. He just feels like he's, he's just trying to survive. And God comes and visits him. This is this an amazing part of the story. God comes, brings an angel, and visits this, this, this guy, Gideon, and he, uh, and he speaks to him. And he says, I'm going to use you. I'm going to bless you. And we're going to see from this story how God blesses somebody because he wants to use you and he wants to bless you. So how he blesses somebody and then how we can have a lasting legacy. Now, the first three we see Gideon responding well to. The second three about having a lasting, a lasting legacy, Gideon doesn't do so well on that part. So we're going to be able to learn from both his, the things he does right as well as the things he didn't do so well at. <clears throat> So here the angel comes, says, notice with me on your outline, there we're dropping in at verse 6, I mean, excuse me, chapter 6 of verse 12. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. So this, is, this is God's first statement where he gives him this word of affirmation. And if we're going to be blessed, we have to receive this word of affirmation. God wants to affirm us. He sees us usually differently than we see ourselves. We usually see ourselves lower than he sees us we see ourselves with all these limitations all these things we can't do all the things we aren't that we wish we were and God wants to come and his his we see this all throughout the Bible he comes and he speaks a word of affirmation and says I see something great in you I see something great in you Jesus did this when he went to Peter Peter was always making stupid comments foot in his mouth he was uh always speaking out of turn, and Jesus says, you know, I see you as a rock. This is what Peter means in in Greek. He says, I see you as a solid rock. Well, this was not his reputation, and yet Jesus speaks this word of affirmation into his life, and he then builds, ends up building the church on him, and, 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 and he ends up being a key part of the team of evangelizing the world, launching a worldwide evangelistic movement, and God sees things in us that we don't see. So this is what he does. He comes to to Gideon, Gideon just sees himself hiding in a wine press, trying to get some wheat, and God speaks this word of affirmation. You are a mighty warrior. He's thinking, uh, you mean a mighty chicken-hearted warrior. And I'm hiding, don't you see that? No, no, God says, no, you're a mighty warrior. And God wants to, he wants to bless him, and he wants to use him, <clears throat> but he begins first by speaking to his self-doubt, because he had a lot of doubt. In fact, just as, as the story goes on, he has to test three different times. Is God even really saying this to me? Is this really true? Because he's filled with so much self-doubt. But God does speak to him. And no, notice with, with me that what, what Gideon ends up doing, he ends up having these excuses. He says, you know, this is, I'm from this small village in Oprah, which means a village of dustiness. That doesn't sound like a, a great place to come from, right? I'm from the village of dustiness. And then he goes on and he says, you know, I'm, 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 I'm from a, this, the wrong family. He goes, but Lord, Gideon asks, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. He goes, don't you understand in, in, in our tribes, I'm, I'm in the smallest tribe, the, the least influential tribe. And in my family, I'm the last born. I'm the run of the litter. How can you use me? I mean, I don't get it. And yet God sometimes uses the most surprising people. See, when there's a great need, God is looking for somebody who's available, somebody who's usable, somebody who's willing to be blessed in order to meet that need. And now we're placed in a community, in a world where there's lots of need. And God looks to us. I mean, so many times our tendency is to think, well, you know, the government should solve that. That's a big problem out there. You know, the education system, they need to get on the stick and do something about the problems of the world. The business leaders, they better come together. And start, I mean, the truth is God often is looking at us. He's looking just like he did. Here's a national problem. And he goes to the most unlikely person. He says, you know what? I'm going to use you to transform this society, to change things around. And God uses us. He blesses us and wants to work through us, but we have to be careful we don't fall into making a bunch of excuses like Gideon does. Here's the lesson. Making excuses will cause me to miss God's plan for my life. God has plans for our lives. And when we make excuses, you know, gosh, I'd really like this, but I'd love to have a better job, but, you know, school's so hard. Costs so much money. I don't think I can do it. 
I'd love to be a parent, but you know, I'm kind of selfish. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not very patient. I don't think I'd be good with kids. And we just make excuses when God wants to bless us, and we just we immediately generate all of these excuses why we shouldn't be blessed, why God's not going to use us. And this can keep us from God's plan that he has for us, this good, promising, loving plan that he has for us. So we have to be careful we don't fall into excuses. Second thing that we see from Gideon's life is, is he responded to God's revelation. His revelation. God has this encounter with him. See, before he was just an Israelite, and he knew about his, the faith of his fathers and how uh, Abraham had gone to, the, to Canaan and to the promised land, and then Moses had helped lead the Israelites out of exile, I mean, out of, out of slavery, and he knew the stories. But now it was personal. Now God's talking to him. That's a whole different animal. That is so different than just learning about the Bible. Listen, I love the Bible. I read the Bible every day. I pray about the Bible. It guides my life. But just reading the Bible is different than having a relationship with God. Those are different. Some of you are on the process of discovering that. God wants to speak into your life. He wants to transform what is just a religion into something where it's much more a relationship, where you're experiencing God's loving touch, where he's speaking to you, and where your faith is being built up. Your life is really changing. It's radically changed. You're seeing your, the way you respond at work, at home, in traffic, you're seeing the way you respond, the way you pay your bills, the way you interact with other people, the, the way you use your time, what offends you, what causes you to want to pray. These things all start to change because you have the, you, this relationship with God. And this is what happened to Gideon. It says, when Gideon realized that he was an angel of the Lord, what, excuse me, what, that he that was the, an angel of the Lord exclaimed, Ah, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the, the Lord face to face. We so have this face to face encounter. He says, But the Lord said to him, Now this is important. Peace. Do not be afraid. You are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar, underline that, built an altar to the Lord there and called it the Lord is peace. Gideon has this personal experience and he builds this altar. He builds these, these stones. And in the Old Testament, and also as a place, a memorial of saying, God met me here. And so they would do that. They wanted to signify, this is a significant moment. I don't want to forget that. This is a milestone. It's a changing, it's a red letter day for me. It's going to change everything. And this is what happened. He's, he, he has this, this altar, and he goes, God met me here. God met me here. And, and God spoke to him and said, hey, you don't have to be afraid. Why? Because he was afraid. And he had a lot to be afraid of. He was seized with fear. And yet God replaces his fear, says, no, no, I'm going to take that fear. Even though you have a lot of reason, externally you have chaos going on, there's war, there's turmoil, there's all kinds of stuff, but I'm going to take out that fear. And in its place, God puts, what does he put? He puts peace, right? He says peace. I'm going to deposit peace into your life. Peace. And he says, he says he called it the Lord is peace. That's Jehovah Shalom. That's the word he says, God gives me peace inside. Now I have this internal peace. I have peace of mind that I haven't had before. And listen, if you're going through turmoil, you're going through difficulty, you have a, a, a relationship that is, that is going sour, you have a, a health crisis that is going down the toilet, you have a, a job or a vocation that is coming unglued at the seams. When you're in turmoil, you need peace. That, and that comes from a relationship with God. When God meets you and he speaks into your life, speaks and then in your knower, you know, you know what? No matter how bad it gets, God's with me. And listen, whenever you're doing God's plan for your life, you can never be a failure because God doesn't fail. God's not a failure. And so you, do, you just decide, I'm going to do God's plan for my life. And this is what's going on with Gideon because God has a big plan for him. But he's making, first he's affirming Gideon, then he has this revelation experience and he's, and he's speaking peace into his heart so, so he, can, he can be successful in what God wants him to do. The lesson is before fighting life's battles, I must first have God's peace. And this is true. This is the first thing. We don't lunge into the battle and then say, gosh, 
Maybe I should pray more. Maybe I need some peace. No, we, we, we gain that first. Then, thirdly, when God blesses somebody, he brings transformation. But it happens after these first two. He brings in affirmation. Then he speaks a word of revelation where we get to know him personally. And then transformation. This is where Gideon really gets his power. It says, the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Literally, this says, this is translated, the spirit of the Lord was clothed over him. And I like that because that means all of his insecurities, all of his, his, uh, his, his lacking, his lack of faith, his doubts, his fears, all that stuff, see, is, 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 is now clothed with God's presence, God's power, God's peace. God transforms Gideon from somebody hiding in a wine press, a loser really, into a leader. The lesson is power always comes after testing. There's a period of testing, but the testing's not really over because the power still, God still wants to come in this and, and has this great plan, and it involves testing. Here's what he leads him to do. He says, okay, I want you to gather all the Israelites. And so, and so Gideon does that. He takes his trumpet out. He sounds the alarm. All of the Israelites come out of their caves. They gather around. And he says, we're going to do something about this Midianite crisis. We're not going to hide anymore. 32,000 men came, fighting men came to, came to say, we're going to answer the call to this. And then he prays and God says, well, that's actually too many people. Uh, I, I, I want you to thin them out, thin the ranks out. And so he goes, okay. And, and, and God says, okay, what I want you to do is tell all 32,000, any of you who are afraid, the same thing that Gideon had suffered from, and any of you that are, have fear going on about this, you can leave. Now, this might not be the best thing to tell because they were already outnumbered. The Midianites had 135,000. They only had 32,000. That doesn't look good. This probably, that would cause a, a lot of people to have fear, and it did. You, there were so many people that were afraid, 22,000 of them left. They said, oh, yeah, well, I'm afraid, and they left. Now he's left with 10,000. The odds are worse. So he goes to God, and he goes, God, now I'm down to 10,000. He goes, well, listen, I'm going to solve that. It's gonna, we're going to test the test a little more here, and we're going to thin the troops some more because if, if it's just 10,000, it's still they could credit it maybe to themselves. And so he goes, what I want you to do is go to this stream, which is now in Israel called Gideon Spring. It's still there. And so they go to this stream. He goes, I want you to tell them all to take a drink out of the stream and watch them. He goes, anybody who just gets on their hands and knees and then they just drink from the, from the stream, you know, right? Then he goes, th then I, I'm going to have you send them away. Those of them who cup with their hands so they kind of stay vigilant, you know, maybe they have their sword at their side and they're cupping their hands and they're drinking the water, lapping it out of their hands. He goes, those are the ones I'm going to have you to keep. So he counts which ones are using their hands to drink water. And he finds only 300. 9,700 of them go home. So now he's left with 300. He goes, okay, God, now we're down to 300. God goes, that's perfect. That's just the number I want. He goes, now get your weapons. He goes, okay, what weapons? He goes, okay, you're going to need a clay jar for each person. He goes, okay, a clay jar. Then you're going to need a torch for each person. And then you're going to need a trumpet or a horn for each person. He goes, these are the three things that they're going to need. So that's what they go into. 300 against 135,000 with a clay pot, a torch, and a trumpet. And they go in at midnight. It's pitch dark. And they, they, make a, they encircle, because they're all down in the, in the valley, they encircle it. They light their torches, but they put the clay pot so that it can't be seen. And then Gideon says, okay, on my cue, everybody's going to blow their trumpet, and they're going to yell for the Lord and for Gideon, and then they're going to break their jar, and then the light's going to come out, and it's going to throw them in disarray. They're going to turn on themselves, and they're going to kill each other. And this, <clears throat> this is how this battle is won. I put a little clip in there for you in verse 22 through 20 to 22. It says, the three companies blew the trumpets and smashed the jars, grasping the torches in their left hands and holding their right hands, the trumpets they were to blow. They shouted a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. While each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. When the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. So the Midianites, they woke up. They're like, oh, 
you know, they're in their PJs and they grab their swords and it's, they can't see anything. All they can see is all these lights and, this, and all the sound and it's echoing in the valley. And it was common in those days when uh, they didn't have like a Midianite king who brought them all into order. They were just like tribes. And so sometimes they would, they would fight among each other. So this is probably what they thought had happened. Some of them had started fighting against each other and they all grabbed their swords and over 100,000 died. Just killing, they're just watching. The Israelites are just watching, going, dang, look at that. <laughs> and they're just, they're just killing each other. And then, they, then they, they're on the run, and they run away. And, and then they're freed for 40 years. 40 years they have this, this peace in the land. And so it's a great story of somebody who was ordinary, who was afraid, who was hiding, who said God could never use me, and yet God uses him. God blesses him. Because God comes in and brings affirmation and then brings revelation and then brings really transformation into his life. And he's blessed beyond measure. In fact, after, the, after that, that battle and a few others, he ends up accumulating a lot of wealth and a lot of influence. Now, as I said, we were going to kind of close to talk about his legacy because, see, this is an area where he doesn't do so well. He has all this wealth, all this influence. He has this, this pretty good resume now that looked pretty good of trusting God, and yet... He drops the ball so we can learn from that. So if we want to be people that utilize the blessings that God gives us, because it's not just for us for today, but our legacy is for others for tomorrow, then we need to do these three things. First of all, to have a lasting legacy, we need to be effective. We have to be effective. We need to learn how to leverage the wealth and the influence that God gives us. <clears throat> In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus tells a story about Three servants, and the master gives them, and this is, a, he's making a, a parable about how God gives us, you know, talents. He says he gives them gold or talents. And two of them, they, they take what God gives them, and they invest it, and they, when, the, when their master comes back, they have increased their wealth. They've been fruitful with it. So they were faithful and fruitful. But the third person, he takes it, and he buries it. He's faithful. He doesn't just waste it. He doesn't spend it but he doesn't invest it. He's not fruitful. And so he's rebuked. You see, as Christ followers, we're required to be faithful and fruitful. This is what it means to have an effective legacy, that you're fruitful with what God gives you. Now, this is an area that Gideon doesn't do so well. He goes with this money. He gets 43 pounds of gold after one of these, one of these uh, exploits. And he takes it and he goes and he buys this ephod. Notice with me there in verse 27. Gideon made the gold into an ephod, which he placed in Orphra, that's his hometown, in, in his town. All Israel prostituted themselves by worshiping it there. And it became a snare to Gideon and his family. So what is an ephod? Well, I've read the Bible commentaries. They're divided on this. Most of them say, we don't really know. Now, certainly in Exodus, Exodus uh chapter eight, uh, 28, it talks about a high priest having an ephod. It's like a garment, and it's uh, kind of like an apron that they would wear, and they have this linen breastplate over it, and then they have these, these rocks where they have inscribed the tribes of Israel, and that helps them to figure out what God's will is. And so it might have been that, but it's not for a high priest. If he does it, he just sets it out, and it becomes like a shrine. So he takes this, this money, and he makes this, this shrine, much like what his father had had. His father had put up this shrine of Baal that Gideon had smashed in his youth and said, no, I'm going to do things for God. And now here he is using his wealth, using his influence to build a shrine that's causing people to stumble. It's causing people to not grow in their faith. People are not being impacted spiritually in a positive way, but instead a negative way. Now, his intentions were probably good. That's what I could assume. Gideon seems to be a good guy. I don't think he was out to hurt people, but he ended up hurting people because he was not effective with his legacy. He, he, he just didn't think it through. Maybe it was unclear. Maybe he just put that ephod out there. It meant something special to him, but nobody else figured it out. You know, that happens when, uh, when uh, people die without a will. I've seen it many, many times. They die, and the kids, uh, they don't know what to do. There's no will, or there was unclarity, and they're thinking, well, what did mom want to do with you know, with her belongings? Should we give them away? Should we sell them? 
What, you know, she lived a life of generosity, always supporting the work of God. Does she want some of her, her, her leftover wealth, some of that to uh, go in that direction? Or are we just supposed to, you know, give it to, uh, you know, United Way? Or, I mean, what do we do? Or do we just divide every penny between the kids? And there's unclarity. With unclarity, see, it's, 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 we can't be effective. And so being effective is an important part of having a, last of, a lasting legacy. Second thing is being focused. You need to be, we are, need to be very focused and know what's your business and know what's none of your business. See, Gideon got overextended. He was too involved. And that day when you had wealth, some people would take their wealth and their influence and they would buy additional wives. Now, the Bible never says to do that. It never says, hey, go buy a bunch of wives. That's a great thing. No, in fact, Every time in the Bible somebody had a lot of wives, it always caused them extra hardship, extra heart, heartache, which kind of goes, you know, that doesn't take a rock scientist to figure that out, right? <laughs> and, he, and he has all these wives. Some of them are in different locations, different cities. He ends up having, through these wives, 70 sons. See, it says now Gideon had 70 sons. That guy was busy. <laughs> Who were his direct descendants, for he had many wives. He, he not only had wives, he had concubines. Concubines, that's not a piece of farm equipment, in case you're wondering. A concubine was a, was like a second, it was a legal wife, but it was like a second class wife because often they came in through slavery. They were female slaves. And then sometimes they would, they would uh, get promoted, you know, to this wife status. But, they, but any children that they had would not really be part of the family and they were, they, they were you know, often rejected and despised sometimes. So this has happened to one of his wives and, and one of his concubines. She's in a different city and he spread himself too thin. He can't really invest his life into these, into these young men. I have three sons. I've, it took me a lot of time and effort to invest my life just into those three guys. Could, I couldn't imagine 70 sons. You know, the, it's just spreading himself too thin. One of the sons of the concubine, his name's Abimelech, ends up after Gideon dies, he decides to murder all of his brothers because he, he doesn't like the position in the family he's got. Now, I don't think Gideon was responsible for all that, but he, was, you know, he could have been more focused in the way he lived his life and he would have had a different legacy because he, Abimelech did murder all of the kids except one. One got away. And then in three years, Abimelech had ended up, he ended up dying because uh, people turned on him. So his legacy ended up uh, you know, only having one, one son anyways. You see, we need to be focused. Focus is the key to, to, to having a lasting legacy. Like light that is diffused does not have the power of light that is focused. You know, the sun doesn't burn us up because it's diffused. But if you take a magnifying glass like I did when I was a kid and you put it on a little bug, the bug pops. The bug catches on fire or grass or whatever. Maybe you weren't a bug person. Come on, you did that. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but it has power. You, light focused can be a laser, cut through steel, can cut out cancer, can correct vision. The key to an effective and lasting legacy is focus, be focused. And then number three, be strategic. Being strategic. He had, Gideon had a lot of influence, a lot of wealth, but he, he didn't have a strategic plan. And the plan that he had was not sound. He didn't it, it, it was not a thought-through plan. He didn't have a good succession that was realistic. It was idealistic, but it wasn't realistic because he was asked, hey, we should have some leaders. We should, you should appoint a leader. And he goes, no, no, no. When I die, nobody's going to lead. You guys will just have God lead you. Look, this is what he says. The Israelites said to Gideon, rule over us, you, your son, your grandson. They're basically saying anybody because you have saved us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon told them, I will not rule over you. No, where my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. Listen, that sounds nice on paper. But, it, you know, in all the churches I know, we want the Lord to rule over us. But we still have a leadership structure. They still need leaders. You still need infrastructure in place. You still need containers for God, you know, ministry containers so that you can have uh, organization and you can be effective and you can be focused. That's all part of being strategic, thinking through a plan. And God wants you to be strategic with your life and with your plan, with your wealth, with your influence. Because God wants you to have an effective 
and focused and strategic return on your investment, which means it's effective and eternal. Effective and eternal. Do you know two-thirds of contributions given are given outside the church? And while that's noble, that is not eternal. You see, when we give and we partner up with the local church, which is the hope of the world, and we give our resources and we do our good works in combination with the gospel, we're not only changing lives, we are changing eternities. This is what it's all about. That's how you're going to have faithfulness and fruitfulness. That's how you're going to be effective and you're going to be focused and you're going to be strategic. That's what we can learn from Gideon. We can do things different. We can learn from people that, hey, they didn't do it, you know, the best way. Let's improve. Let's make it, let's make it the best difference with our life that we can. Okay? Let's bow our heads and we'll pray. I believe that God wants to give you a new view of you. He wants to speak a word of affirmation to the very area that you are struggling with the most. If it's doubt, he wants to say, I see you, O mighty one of faith. If it's fear, He's going to speak to that. Say, I, I don't see a fearful person. I see somebody who's a mighty warrior, somebody that I can use. God says he wants to bless you. And we need to be blessable. So the affirmations that God speaks to us, we receive them. We say, God, thank you that you believe in me. Did you know God does believe in you? Some of you came here this morning, and the one thing he wants to say to you is, is that he believes in you. So many times we go to church and we're here to say we believe in God, but did you know that God wants to say he believes in you? He believes that you can make a difference way bigger than you see yourself probably making a difference. Some of you need to have that revelation. You're going through the motions, you're you're reading the Bible, you're, you're, you're coming to church. You you have some friends here, and I'm thankful for that. But the truth is, you're lacking that relationship. And you know it. And so you divert. You try not to bring it up. You try to avoid situations where that's going to be exposed. But God is wanting to say, I want to bring my peace into your life. I want to inject you with faith and hope. I want to help transform your life. And friend, that begins with just prayer. That's the entryway. You say yes to Jesus. Yes, God, I want you in my life. Do that with me right now. If you've never received Christ, or maybe it's a long time, maybe you've, you, you used to serve God, but it's, it's now in the past. Today he's calling you home, and you can do that just by saying, Jesus Christ, come into my life. Holy Spirit, transform me. Would you do that? Just write in your mind. It's not about joining this church. It's about you allowing God to transform you. Say, today, right now, I'm going to put my faith in Christ. Forgive me. Would you say, God, forgive me for when I just try to do things on my own. Today, I want a clean conscience, a fresh start. Start igniting my faith for me. I don't want to have to hide. I want to be somebody who's blessable. Some of you need to pray about your legacy. And legacies begin not on your deathbed. They begin way, way before that, decades before that, when you say, God, I want to make a lasting legacy. Help me to be effective. Help me to be focused the world is filled with distractions. You say, God, help me to be focused and help me to be strategic. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com and we'll see you next week.